Hey students, in this episode, we are going to talk about practicing. I'm gonna give you some tips about how to practice better on your instrument. But first, I wanted to show you <laughs> just this clip from like 2015. So this is a while ago. This is when my wife and I were first married. We bought like paints and we borrowed an easel and we, we got some stuff so that we could follow along with a Bob Ross video so that we could paint something. And we recorded our reveal to each other. So we both did our own and we didn't show each other. We would just look at Bob, the Bob Ross video and then we would work on our own little painting but we, uh, we wanted to show each other at the end, and so we recorded it so we could see. And her painting was a lot better than mine. <laughs> so um, let's go ahead and go to that clip. We're doing the big reveal <laughs> of our Bob Ross painting. So this is what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> kind of like Minus that. the words. Minus the words. And this is, this is... The evidence that yeah. we had palettes. This is her palette, her colors that she used. Do you want to talk about the colors at all? Nope. Okay. Here's my palette. You'll notice they're pretty similar. <laughs> they are indeed. Okay, here we go. One, one, one two, 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 three, three. go. go. about that? Okay, so hers is on the left and mine is on the right. Your trees look great, Felicia. My last trees, they actually kind of turned out. They look, they look great. I didn't know how to make the twiggy parts with the really small brush because it kept making all my browns and blues mixed together so I gave up on the little brush. <clears throat> wow. wow. Well, she, she does have a little bit more experience now because she already did one. <laughs> her, her, her barn thing turned out better than mine. Hey, yours looks nice and rustic. Great. Mine just look like blobs. Yeah, I like it though. That is the best tree. Is that your tree you were proud of? No, it's actually this one. Well, you covered it up. I accidentally did it because I was in a hurry. Mm -hmm. What happened was we finished it. Well, we didn't finish. We we started it yesterday and then we went to my parents' house and we ran out of time to do like this below the barn thing. And then we came back and we finished it today. So we were kind of going fast because we weren't thoroughly in the mood today. Didn't, we didn't really want to I like much the time. depth in here that you have, mister. Well, that's our first experience with Bob Ross, Bob Ross painting. Hopefully there will be more, maybe. <laughs> there will be, right? Yeah. Yeah, there'll be, it more, was fun. We need more paint. We do. Bye. So this is a little random, but um, look how beautiful this place is that we live in. These mountains are so gorgeous. Seriously. I just, I, I don't know. I, when I first moved to Utah, I was in junior high. I lived here for one year, then we moved away to Colorado, and then we came back. And when I moved here in junior high, I hated Utah. I hated it. I hated how bright the sun was because I moved from Washington State from Seattle and it just felt like the sun was really bright here. I was always squinting. Um, I hated how dry it was. I hated how there, there weren't any like forests of trees and stuff. I hated the taste of the water. I hated just a lot of things about Utah when I first moved here. It has grown on me so much. I love it now. Like look at how beautiful that mountain is. The mountains are gorgeous. The mountain biking is great. Like we, we live in a great state. It's beautiful here. It's okay if you don't like it. It's okay if you've moved from somewhere or if you've lived here your whole life and you don't like it. But seriously, like, it's just a gorgeous place to live. These mountains, every time I see them, especially in the morning and, and in the evening, like right before the sun sets. Oh, it's just so beautiful. Guys, we live in a very cool place. So this is probably gonna date me a little bit, <laughs> um, what I'm about to do. So I, I consider myself a millennial, but I'm like on the very oldest edge of being a millennial. So one of the things that I love, that I don't know if, if kids your age do, I, I just don't know if this is like an old person, like older millennial thing, but I love animated, is it GIFs or GIFs? Hmm. What I, I actually call them Jifes, <laughs> which is from 
a video that I'll link it in the description. I'm just so sick of being corrected. And so is this guy that I stole his idea and just call him Jaif. So in this segment of the video, I'm going to call them animated Jaifs. And if you don't like it, then just skip forward. But, um, so I just want to talk about some of my favorite Jaifs. <laughs> These are all old, super probably overused, but I just think they're so funny still. <laughs> even now which this is probably showing how like old I am because I'm still into these but I love in text messages sending animated jifes because growing up and still now but especially growing up I used to quote movies and tv shows all the time like in every situation lots of people do and to me jifes feel like the best way to uh, to express that idea when you're texting or messaging somebody. <laughs> so anyway, this is going to be weird, but these are some of my favorite jifes from the past. Some of these are like 10 years old or older, but I thought, why not? Let's, let's do it. Let's talk about it. <clears throat> so this one, <laughs> it, the, I guess if I was really preparing well for this, I would, I would find out what the names of these jifes are. <laughs> I don't know. But I just think this one is so funny. If you watch the, the YouTube video, it's like, dun, dun, dun. I love this one, Keanu Reeves. <laughs> just because his face is so, like, sincere and just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> this one, the character is Lucille Bluth from Arrested Development. She's such an evil character. And just this eye roll is just the best. <laughs> this one also, I love this one. <laughs> She's just the biggest, most dramatic eye roll. Oh, I love it. Sending this to people in a text message is just the best. Like, this is so old. But you send this one, or at least I send this one when it's basically like saying, cool story, bro, or like, oh, huh, good idea. When you're like kind of being sarcastic, like, like I don't really think it's a good idea, but like, yeah, sure, cool. Or just like, huh, that's all right, cool, cool idea. I don't know. It's it's when you're kind of making fun of the other person a little bit. I love this one so much. This is like a super classic. When you send this, just like, yep, gotcha. You're right. Kudos to you. You know, that type of thing. I don't know if this one was very popular. Monica from Friends. And she's going, I know. <laughs> I just love sending this to someone when you like, they say something and you're like, yeah, exactly. I know. This is Haymitch from The Hunger Games given like a thumbs up like yeah you go girl or like you you've got this or like nice job like that's it and i don't know why i just love this one and this one this is i this is way overused it's classic <laughs> so you usually send this one when there's like a thread of a bunch of people arguing over something and you said this like like i'm just here to watch it just oh yeah loving loving the drama and this is my favorite. I send this all the time. Tobias Funke from uh, Rest of Development just going, huzzah! But this one, I use all the time. I probably use this more than any other jife. So anyway, that's my, uh, that's my silly uh, little, little discussion about <laughs> these stupid animated jifes. And uh, I don't know, what do you think? Do you say GIF or do you say JIF? I've heard both arguments. You don't have to explain to me why you use one or the other because I've watched several videos about it. I know that there's a difference. That's why I say JIF is so I can say, forget all you guys, I'm doing it this way just to annoy all of you. Anyway, JIF, to call it whatever you want. It's up to you. Okay, bye. So we're gonna do a little segment on, on these episodes of Hey Students. I'm going to call practicing tips from Mr. Vogt. Our first practicing tip from Mr. Vogt. So I want to talk about practicing your instrument. So it isn't really that hard, but especially when you're new to learning an instrument, it's a little difficult to um, know what to practice and how to practice effectively. I honestly did, wasn't good at practicing until after I was done with college. <laughs> It took me a long time to understand how to do it. And I wish I wish a teacher would have just sat me down and said, this is what you do. And uh, maybe they did and I just was too much of a moron to catch it. I want to be able to teach you guys that practicing, it's so important. It's just like learning to dribble a basketball. Like you're not just gonna be able to show up to basketball practice and just automatically know how to dribble a ball. You have to spend time at home playing, whether it's with your buddies or by yourself. It, it's just practicing an instrument, you don't just 
become awesome at playing your instrument. So you have to practice at home. The problem is, since so many people your age, since they were never taught how to practice correctly, a lot of you don't like doing it just because you don't understand like how to do it. Eventually, once you get good at practicing, there comes a point where you enjoy it and you look forward to it and you get bummed out when you're not able to or when it gets cut short or you're interrupted. Once you get to that point where you enjoy practicing, you just soar and take off how good you are because it just feeds itself. And I have gotten to that point before and it is awesome. Um, over the next few episodes of Hey Students, I'm gonna give you guys some tips about practice. I wanna give you just little bite-sized tips. So today, speaking of bite-sized tips, my first suggestion for how to practice, and this is probably one of the most important parts, is to do bite-sized bits. <laughs> so basically what you do when you're practicing, practicing is not going through and just playing the whole song or the whole piece of music or your whole part or the whole solo from beginning to end over and over again. Because what you will do is you'll just get really good at doing it wrong. What you do more often will become permanent. So you need to do it right enough times so that your body, your the muscles in your hands and your, your arms and your, your body memorizes the feeling and memorizes how to do whatever it is you're trying to practice. So you wanna put it into your muscle memory so that you don't have to think about it and it, your body just does it. And in order to do that, you have to do it more times correctly than you do incorrectly. So when you play the whole piece over and over again, from the beginning to the end, you're just reinforcing yourself doing it wrong. Because you, if you mess up and you just keep going, you're gonna mess up there again. And every time you mess it up, you're teaching your brain, this is how you're supposed to do it. Just do it that way every time. Instead of doing that, what you do is you focus on little chunks, little bite-sized chunks, that you are not good at. Another mistake that a lot of young players will do will be they go home, they get out their instrument, and they play the same thing over and over again because it's it's easy and they can sound good on it. And so they get really good at like one or two pieces. Instead, if you want to get better, you need to you need to work on the stuff that's difficult. Find a little section of the music that is hard for you. Um, that could just be one measure, or it could be a few measures, or it could even be just two or three or four notes and you just find that one little section that you can't do that one little thing and then what you do is you do that over and over and over again so many times until your body just does it and it becomes easy often when i'm working on something like that i will slow it down so slow that it becomes easy so basically here's my words of advice there's no such thing as difficult there's only easy and too fast so if it's too fast, slow it down until it's easy. And then play it maybe 10 times um, correctly at that speed. And then make it a teeny bit faster. Do it another 10 times correctly. Then a little teeny bit faster and then speed it up again. <clears throat> and do it 10 times correctly and do it over and over and over again. And if you really focus and do that, you could learn like a measure or two measures that's difficult. It would only take like five minutes, if that. If you, did, if you were just focused and just went for it and really, really um, put your mental energy in, into f practicing like that. And then once you speed it up, get it to where how fast it should be and then maybe speed it up even more so that, and get good at doing it even faster than it's supposed to be so that when you slow it down to where it's supposed to be, it'll feel like, ah, this is so easy now. That's how you get better. And if you do that every day, if you just spend five minutes even doing that every day, focusing really intent on one little section, over months of doing that, you are gonna improve so much. And that improvement in your sound and in your ability on the instrument is going to motivate you to keep practicing. And that's when you get into that loop where you enjoy practicing and so you do it more, which makes you better, which makes you enjoy it more which makes you do it more and it, you just spiral up. So any of these people that you've heard that are really good on their instrument, we have several musicians at our school who are excellent musicians. And the reason why they're so good is because they've learned how to practice. It's not because some magic gene that they have. It's not some magic thing. Like any of you, any of you, no matter where you come from, what you look like, who you are, how old you are, what your family is like, how rich or poor you are. Any of you have the ability to become good at your instrument if you really dig in and practice correctly. So 
to review. You take one section, you identify something that's hard, and you make it small, so just one little section. It could be two notes, it could be five notes, it could be a whole measure, maybe two measures, whatever it is. You identify that one little phrase and you slow it down until it's easy, and you do it a whole bunch of times at that easy tempo. So maybe five times, maybe 10, you do it a bunch until it's easy and you've got it. Then you speed it up just a teeny bit, and you do it another time, 10 times, speed it up. And you keep doing that until finally you're up to tempo and you're, you're playing it as fast as you should be, and you've got it. And that, that really could take five or 10 minutes and you're done. When you practice, you don't have to be practicing a huge chunk of time. Um, it's not that important how much time you practice. What's important is how much musicality that you put into your thinking as you practice and that you practice smartly and you don't just play the whole piece over and over again, that you focus on the stuff that's hard until it's not hard anymore. And then you're a little bit better and every day you get better, okay? Consistency is very important. Practice every single day. It's better to do a little bit every day than to do a whole bunch on one day. So instead of practicing like two hours on a Saturday, just practice for five or 10 minutes every single day. That's, that's your advice. That's, that's today's practicing tips from Mr. Vogt. Okay, students, that's it. That's episode 11 of Hey Students. Thank you again for watching. You guys are awesome. So yeah, that's Hey Students. Um, I hope you have a good week and I'll catch you on the flippity flip. <laughs>